What's happening, everybody? Thank you for being here. I'm so glad to see you after a few days off. I would have been here on Monday, but we had an ice storm in Portland. So uh, my next guest and I might be able to talk a little bit about crazy storms and inability to get to and from our house. Hopefully you guys all have power and internet and you're safe and warm. I know my friends in Texas right now are struggling. So if you're watching this in your cell phone, you don't have to use up all this uh, cell service and your, your battery. You can watch an archive of this. So make sure that you subscribe to this, <clears throat> excuse me, subscribe to the channel right here at this link, youtube.com slash all access live with Kevin Rankin. If you do that, you're going to push me up over the 1000 subscriber mark, which is how I'm going to give away a really cool prize. There's an, a there's a flock of seagulls giveaway that I've got a whole bunch of old lanyards and backstage passes and guitar picks and uh, signature sticks and all that. But the cool thing is that you're going to get to host All Access Live with a flock of seagulls. So you get to be the interviewer. You can ask all four of us questions and uh, make fun of the goofy hairdos and all that good stuff. So get us to the 1,000 subscriber mark, and I'm going to take a random subscriber to be the winner for that event. So now I've got really cool guests coming up this week. But before I get started, I want to tell you that my buddies at Five Star Guitars have been a sponsor of the show. They're incredibly supportive and they're based in Beaverton, Oregon, which means that there's no sales tax. So if you're a guitarist like my next guest and you're looking for good gear, you're not going to find better gear or better deals, better service, better repairs or lessons than Five Star Guitars. The NAM Association voted them as vendor of the year this year. So they are the number one guitar store in the world. So if you're outside the U.S., you can still order guitars and get great deals. If you go to this link, fivestarguitars.com slash all access live and enter this promo code of all access 15. There are five or six pages there of great deals that you're going to get 15% off using the promo code and then you know, pay sales tax. So you're going to save more dough. So go to uh, fivestarguitars.com slash all access live. Buy your guitars, get your lessons, get some repairs done. Pros like Jennifer Batten, who's hosting her Guitar Cloud Symposium again this weekend. If you go to Guitar Cloud Symposium right now, um, guitarcloudsymposium.com, you'll have a crazy four-day workshop with Jennifer Batten and a whole bunch of pros. Special guest, Dweezil Zappa, I believe, this week as well. So Steve Vai has been a special guest in the past. If you go to guitarcloudsymposium.com, and sign up. She's got a really good deal right now. It starts tomorrow. So don't miss out on that. She's a instructor for Five Star Guitars. So you can get lessons from her after she's done with the symposium. Tomorrow, I've got an amazing band from Canada. They were in the, the Canadian Hall of Fame, um, Canadian Music Hall of Fame. Spoons are going to be on tomorrow. Sandy Horn and Gord Depp of the Spoons are going to be here with me. And uh, we'll talk to Gord about being the new guitarist. Not new. He's been in for three years. The guitarist for A Flock of Seagulls and uh, the 40th anniversary of Spoons. So that's tomorrow. Great guests next week. We've got uh, John Wilson, amazing keyboardist who I went to high school with. He's a virtuoso, one of the most sought after pianists for instruction online. Tons of funk and jazz and groove stuff on YouTube. So if you look up Jonathan Wilson, you'll have him here on All Access Live next week. Bad Brad Berkwit from the Florida Boxing Hall of Fame. He's got a great podcast and radio show where we'll talk politics and boxing and music. That's next week. And then a partner for my next guest, uh, somebody that has done some charity work and a bandmate of mine, Maury Brown, will be at the end of next week. So you can find out all about that stuff if you go to, to youtube.com slash all access live with Kevin Rankin, subscribe to the channel, and you'll get access to over 150 episodes of the show that I've done during the pandemic. You'll also be notified about the upcoming shows, and you can watch an archive of my next guest. So I want to tell you, um, this guy has worn so many hats, even since the mid nineties, when I moved to Portland, um, Brian Harrison has been a, um, rec he's, uh, had record deals with his rock band, dirty rhythm. We've played a bunch of shows together, lots of charity shows. He's managed guitar shops in Portland. He has, uh, a, um, a great eye for travel and food. So we're going to cover all that stuff. He's got a lot of hats to wear. So let's get started. Lots of fun. Here's Brian Harrison. What's happening, man. Hi. Hi, you That's got your monster. You got your monsters of rock shirt on. I'm glad you're pimping that. Like three minutes before I came, I'm like, oh, I gotta get this shirt on. Oh, you didn't have clothes on before, did you? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wears pants on this show. Yeah. Um, 
hey man you know if we before we go into the history of uh brian harrison tell me a little bit about monsters of rock and how you guys got that thing started okay i'll try to make it as quick as possible all right and while you do before you start I got to say hi to my friends in Germany. They're waiting up late. So Claudia Odenthal, thank you for being here. Judy Smith, thank you for chiming in. And Tony Perkins, thanks for being here, guys. All right, Brian Harrison, tell me about Monsters of Rock. Um, boy, oh, boy. Okay. Um, years, years, years ago, and I can't remember the exact date, but uh, um, a friend of ours, guitarist, phenomenal guitarist named Joey Lamella, he died. And there was um, at the River, River, it's on River Road, the River What's the name of the bar? The River House? River it, House? River. It, was, it was down in Oak Grove. I know that by the Oak Grove Tavern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right there. The, okay, Oak Grove. Anyway, um, there was a, you know, a get together of musicians that, you know, all gathered and, and they got up and they were playing and talking about Joey and, and everything. And we were just standing. There. I was there with Dane Ryan. And we were standing there and, and I was watching this go down and I was looking at all these people. And even back then, because we're old, we haven't seen each other for a while, you know, a lot of people, a lot of musicians. So it's just kind of like, this is kind of cool. You know, look at all these people here. I mean, it's sad that it takes somebody to die for us all to get, you know, get together and 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 play some music, play some rock and roll. And, um, you know, our wheels were turning at that point. And, and I think Dane said something, why don't we just do this again? So it was set up as a tribute to the loss of Lamelo, but it was also a fundraiser. Is that right? I think so. Yeah. It, okay. It, and and um, I don't. You know what? I don't know if it was a fundraiser or not. To be honest with you, maybe it was. And if I forgot, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, but the idea was really sparked there because it was so. It felt so good to see people I haven't seen in a long time play together. Okay. And these were people that weren't necessarily in bands together and everything, and just kind of doing things. And I just, the wheels were just turning and I'm, I'm like, we, that's where the concept started. That's where it was birthed. And then we, and then we talked it out and got Maury involved and it really came out to be, it's so, it wouldn't it be cool to get people together that, I mean, the, the community is small here, but it's still big. And there's yeah. a lot of people that have never played with each other or knew about this band, but I don't really know the guy or, so we kind of purposefully made these bands and put people together it was easier at first. Later, we kind of had a core core that would help the other the new people that came in. But we made it a point to make sure that somebody was going to be in that band that kind of really didn't know the other guy, never played in a band with him, didn't just no concept, right? right. And forced these strangers who were all part of the community to play something together. And we assigned, you know, and we had to think it out as far as who who has the voice who could be like you know the police or who who's the guitar player who could be like you know so we tried to form these super bands to best suit the song list that we chose and genre and, and stuff and that was fun and it it was just it was awesome I mean I remember the first one and and we just we had to just keep doing this and I think we've got seven or eight but and I don't we're we've talked about doing it again and and we'll see when. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, it, it's just mini sets, super groups of alumni from Portland around the area that has been in the in in the scene since the seventies all the way to now. So yeah, we were putting now we were putting like icons from the, the beginning of the rock scene together with people who are kind of like newer or fresher, and they're like, whoa, you know, and 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 new and new relationships happen, and it honestly sparked a lot of the the um tribute scene right it, it definitely it definitely contributed to a lot of the tribute thing i remember you know felma was going this is pretty cool what what you got what you guys did and then it's like i'll take a little bit of credit man because it it, it kind of blew up you know maury and, and dane and i just kind of watched things go like this after yeah. we did that and it was like wow look look what the seeds we planted and look what grew you know out, out of it all and a lot of people came out of the the, the bedroom or, their, or made time in their lives, told their wives, I'm going to go rock with the boys in the garage kid, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, and so the stories and people were posting their their rehearsal sessions and, and getting excited about the show. And people were, it, it was a it was a brotherhood, man, and, and, and a sisterhood. We had, we had uh, you know, we try to keep it as diverse as possible. And, and it was neat to see people get excited and get sparked and then suddenly pick up their guitar and do it again or sing again and, and form a band. And this is right. so can't believe this and, and so for me you know and of course we we did the charity and we if we were doing new avenues for youth 
uh, for, you know, for the homeless youth. And, and then, and we got, when Maury got involved and, and he was talking about his, his son a lot. And I'm like, ah, why aren't we doing this for autism? So we also did it. We did a few for autism and, and, um, you know, and then that also sparked Maury to go, you know, Maury wanted a more centric autism thing and he had a thing going on, which he, which he does up in, in Vancouver, you know? So, I mean, the whole thing from that, from Joey Lamello, figure, right. you know, just kind of went and it branched off and all this stuff happened. And it's like, um, it's pretty cool. Don't you yeah. think if you uh, if you were to talk to Joey now, don't you think he'd just say, "You guys have to be kidding me"? But how proud he would be to see what yeah. it's done, you I, know? You know, Joe. It, it maybe it sounds kind of creepy, but I think Joey visits me sometimes right in this room. Yeah, I mean, I always respected him as a guitar player and a drummer and whatever else he picked up. And I was like, dude, you what do you you'd play everything? Yeah, and and he was very good, and he's a kooky dude, man. But he was, um, I hung out with him. Some late nighters and you know a lot of stories. I won't go down that road, but anyway, <laughs> he, you know, um, I always aspired to be more on a level like him. A lot of people respected him, so I'll I'll find myself practicing or doing something where I'm laying a track, and and all of a sudden, just it's like I feel this tap on my shoulder, and I'm like, oh, he's watching me. Wow, and, and I'm like, I wonder if Joey would approve of this. He'd be going, oh, fuck yeah, Brian. yeah, and I'd be going, all right, Joe, Joey approves. I, you know, he creeps in. He creeps in. The guy had, he was one of the most talented musicians I'd ever seen. And I moved here mid 90s, right? 94 uh, right. to Portland. And I'd heard about Joey Lamello when I met him. And then the legend of Joey Lamello sort of followed, right? Um, meeting him for the first time, you would never know that guy was as talented as he was. You right. know, he, uh, but uh, there are a lot of people in town that are like that, right? They're just understated. And then you see them play. And I think people that come from outside the Portland area are so blown away by the talent that's here in Portland. You know, I mean, you talked about bands from the seventies and of course there are bands like quarter flash and new shoes and, and uh, shock and cooler and dirty right. rhythm, all these bands, you know, had, had made their way up. But uh, I think um, other musicians, world-class musicians that have moved here, Jennifer Batten, Eddie Martinez, these kind of guys that move here are, I think welcomed because there's a brotherhood, like you said, there's camaraderie of quality musicians, quality humans, right? There is a local community that supported yeah. each other. You know, like the Monsters of Rock thing might not work in say mid eighties, late eighties Sunset Strip era, right? I mean, you were down there during that time, right? Would would bands yeah. have supported each other that way and gone out and done, um, you know? No, I, I was in LA for, about two years, I did a recording engineering program down there, and it was '87. Okay, you know, six '87, the heart of it. And, and you know, I remember seeing Guns and Roses and Cinderella. I remember seeing in Bam Magazine the hair bands. Yeah, and I was just looking through the magazine. Going, I can't even tell who's who. They all they have different names, but they look like the same people. Right. You know, and, and I'm looking through this magazine, and I had joined a couple bands down there, and and I, I actually did a. Um, well, here's a good story. Uh, I tried out for an ad in the magazine as a guitar player and I show up to this old theater. I'm sure it was probably an old porn theater or something. <laughs> and there's a line of dudes. All right. And they're all just, and they got the picks and the chains around their neck. And I'm, I didn't really have long hair then. And I was just starting to kind of like, I think I'll grow my hair out. I think I'll, you know, and um, I was just looking at the line going, look at these guys. Oh my God. It was just poser bill. And, and I was a little intimidated at that point. And then, you know, got my turn. We're all standing outside against this wall. You know, then the doors open. And I swear to God, it was Blackie Lawless. Oh, and he had these two girls. And I go on in. I'm like, I know this guy. You know, if it wasn't him, then it was his lookalike. It could have oh, been. My. But you didn't know who you were going to audition for? I uh, can't even remember the name of the band right now. Okay. Uh, he didn't, he didn't announce his name and it was just it was it was, it was weird anyway I, and i was like that's blackie long i didn't want to say hey blackie but yeah. you know and it, anyway i think it really really was but anyway maybe it was but it was just like there was no music no nothing you just kind of you got up on stage you put your aunt there on the stage and he's like back there in the very very back he has a bottle of jack all right man shred what by yourself and, and i'm like shred what is there any music? Any kind of you want me to play to a song or you know, no, just shred. Show me your chops, man. Oh my god. You know, and so I pulled out whatever I could. 
you know, and it was, it was, it was really awful. <laughs> so, so for people that may not know Blackie Lawless, he was the singer for Wasp still is and bass player and uh, known for like drinking the blood out of skulls. And he had big chains or a big saw blade arm bands. And he was yeah. uh, really the, the beginning of the real defiant metal scene that was uh, uh, targeted by the PMRC right back in, in the eighties. And so Tipper Gore and, and that crew were trying to, um, to uh, censor music and Blackie Lawless was like the prime target, right? Cause he was like, just, they, they, we are sexual perverts was the acronym, right? For wasp. And he was uh, absolutely the poster child for the, the uh, PMRC stuff. But I'm guessing he probably was trying to like produce bands at that point. And that's why he was at, back there. Like just, okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's maybe back up before LA then. Cause I know you got, it's those ads that say major label backing da 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 da, you know, and I'm like, ooh, it's my shot, man. Yeah, <laughs> you uh, you didn't go down to LA with any uh, anything set up already. You were just gonna go to school. Yeah, I had spent um, I spent a year in Tel Aviv, Israel, to stay with my mom. She okay. Moved, and it was um, shortly after high school, a couple of years, and I had to get out of Portland. And so I got out of Portland. I had to get away from my whole thing. I That's say, a long way. I had to go, and I, well, I had somewhere to go. Yeah, you know, and somebody who would take me, and and this would be great. So I spent a year there, um, and had to make a decision to go to school. I was going to go to um, college there in in kind of an American quarter of Tel Aviv there. Okay, and, uh, or I was going to go back home. And then I decided I wanted to go back home after a little more than a year. And I decided I was going to be a recording engineer because I was thinking about, you know, I need something to hold on to. If I don't, you know, wanting to be a rock star could be really, you know, it's a pipe dream, man. It's, it's just, and it's like, I need something else, you know? So I said, so that doesn't work. I'm good. I, I want to be in music. I'm creative. I want to, so I, I, I had to learn audio engineering because I love that concept. And so I went to audio engineering school. And so that's why I came back. And so I, I came back, but I came to um, California. Okay, and then, and then I came back to Portland when I was done with that. Yeah, at that point too. I mean, mid '80s, Cali, LA was just popping, right? So that was the place to be. There was really for rock, especially. Um, did you go to Musicians Institute? Is that where you were at then? No, it was called the Dick Grove School of Music, and they had a, a recording engineering program. And it was in the Valley. Okay, there was in Studio City. Yeah, uh, and um, Skip Sailor, he had Sailor Recording. Some of my, do you know uh, Sailor's Country Kitchen? Yeah, that's the same guy. Skip Sailor, the other son, he he had he has a studio down there, and he had the SSL student the board, the Salt State Logic board. He um his room was just the way they built and engineered everybody. He got a reputation of that room, and a lot of people were mixing there. And um, we we did a lot of our training in there towards the end, and uh, so he was uh, that was a weird thing. Absolutely. And and then I'm gonna jump for a second. When Dirty Rhythm went up to Canada and recorded our album with Paul Dean from Loverboy, if you want to talk about that later. We're, yeah, we're getting there. I, okay, I walked into Paul's studio, right? And and it was it was almost built. I think our label money and everything kind of finished his studio as we were in there. Um, but I looked at the big SSL console he had, you know, and then he turned it on. It was a floppy disk thing, remember the floppy disk? Yeah. Anyway. Boom, across the screen, Sailor Recording. I was like, whoa. <laughs> and I go, where'd you get this board? Sailor Recording goes, well, yeah, he sold his board, and I have it now. And I was like, wow, it's a small world. It is a small world. You know, so I, was, I was touching it again going, oh, my God, this is so weird. Does he still have that studio down there? Uh, I have no idea. Okay, yeah, well. I, I get, I get a, a lot of training there, and and I, I also try to get a job down there. I wanted to stay in LA and, and get work, but yeah, it, it's real competitive. I would imagine so. Yeah, you know, even it, to the state. I had to work for about a year for free. Yeah, yeah, it's tough to do, especially you know at this age, so right? Give me coffee. That's <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> a good parking lot, and I'm like, Fuck. God, Matt, you uh, you know, I've, I've talked to so many people that did the um apprenticeship programs down there in LA, you know, just to like work their way in, whether it was record labels or music studios. And it really was sort of a glorified opportunity for, you know, coffee gathering. And, you know, there's just, you know, somebody that was an engineer that didn't really want to teach anyone else. It was just, they wanted somebody to get lunch for them. But I, I did get a job offer to go to Iceland or Japan. Really? 
Yeah, from from when I graduated the school, I, okay. I it was like, well, hey, if you want to go to Japan, I was like, oh, yeah, oh. and you know, and then another one was Iceland. And I think you, you know, I, I wonder if I should. <laughs> you know, well, yeah, yeah but life, life would have been different. What um, you've traveled a ton, so we'll get into that a little bit. But I would imagine, have you been to Japan? No. Have you been to Iceland? No. Okay. Uh, because I was going to ask you after having gone, because I know you, you've traveled a lot of places. I'd be interested to know, you know, what you uh, what you thought about them afterward. Because there are, I'm so guilty of this, man. If you're like me, when I go someplace that just it strikes my eye, I instantly think, okay, if I got a place here and I could live here three months out of the year, you know, and I, the wheels start turning right away, you know, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Iceland is like that, but I don't think I could live there winters, you know, but, yeah. um. You've got tons of family in music, right? So that's one of the things I figured if you got those opportunities to go, uh, you know, Japan or um, Iceland, you have so much family back here. Um, you know, not just, I mean, you you have immediate family, but your family is pretty spread out musically. So were you wanting to get back here and maybe do some music with, say, cousins? That happened later. Okay. But, well, t- t- tell me a, bit, a little bit about where this all came from, right? Because like early Brian, Brian Harrison days, um, you know, there's a lot of music in your family, but where did yours start from? Um, I walked up to my great aunt's piano who used to babysit me in, right. a, in a duplex with my grandma. And um, I just played out a Mary Had a Little Lamb or something by ear. You know, I just went, I played a few keys and went, oh, da, 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 da. and then once that happened, I don't know how young I was, but I, my mom said, lessons yeah so I went immediately into lessons plus my brother played you know okay. he was already kind of started i had an next door neighbor who was a teacher her name is Lori lloyd anyway she um i took a few lessons from her but then my brother was taking from a, a, a fantastic older lady named aurora what an awesome name yeah she was like in her 80s she was a concert pianist aurora underwood and she was so awesome and she was like the best as far as classical piano, yeah, it was it was you know I think Robert O'Hearn, you know Robert, of course, yeah, yeah, he took from her too. That's okay. when I met Robert O'Hearn at a recital. There were and everybody's looking at Robert, going, "Wow, I want to be that good," you know. And right. So that was yeah. he was an inspiration for me when I was a classical piano guy, and and so I mean that's really where it all happened. And so I just start, I was doing lessons all the way till fifteen, sixteen. I got in a band playing some keyboards and they were playing cars, you know, and stuff like that. And here I have this classical experience and I was really got some chops ready to get into a band. And I'm going, just what I needed, you know, yeah. and I was like, Oh man. Yeah. And, and I was watching the guitar player and the, the guitar player actually, um, he, he played the solo in that song. I remember. And I watched him play. And I was like, Oh man, that's what I want to do. Yeah. And it, all, and it all kind of flipped right there that was like i want to be a guitar player my parents were taking guitar lessons together there was a classical guitar laying sitting by the piano and a steel guitar and i just reached i was practicing piano and i would grab the guitar and get their guitar books and i put it in front of me and i just you know classical they really tell you keep your hands curved not don't play like this yeah so I went like this and i went oh yeah and then i looked at the and i have a really good ear and and so i just did the chords i was like oh well, that that's not so bad you know, and so I think I was lucky that I had that ear to begin with, and then some of that training. And I already knew, you know, my teacher's like, you know, whack, you know, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, you know. So um, I picked it up really quick. So, you know, I know you've been teaching a lot. I mean, especially you know, for the last decade or so, you've had a lot of guitar and piano students. Um, I would imagine you were able to take that transition and be able to kind of work with those kids to say, look, it's the same, really the same sort of concept, right? Two handed. Yeah. Okay. But I, I don't know. Guitar is a different animal for some people. Some people can pick it up and are a little more natural than others. It's easy to walk up to a piano and go, ding, hey, nice sound. You know, a guitar, yeah. you got to get your hand right. You know, the fatty part of your finger shouldn't be touching the string. And, you're, and then you got to squeeze and then, and then also their elbows jabbing into their stomach and they're like, and I'm like, it's and I warn I warn a lot of students. I'm going, listen, this isn't easy. Yeah, I'm telling you right now, be prepared to fail, and it's okay. <laughs> it's you're gonna get it, but it's like you're not gonna get instant gratification walking up to a piano like that. It's not gonna happen. That's got to be hard now. 
right? Because kids especially are so used to instant gratification. I mean, yeah. adults, adults are too, right? But if you don't get some sort of, uh, you know, like win out yeah. of say a lesson, I would yeah. imagine you probably have a lot of kids that just say, screw it, man. I'm going to go back to my PlayStation. All I can do is try to, um, you know, I, I learn about how my student can learn. Okay. And they all learn differently. Um, so I have to adapt. And so I've gotten really good at that. Whether it's, it's funny, you could, a phrase so they can get something rhythmic, rhythmically, you can give them a funny little silly sentence and they go, oh, I got it, you know, because of the syllables and, or if some people can't count it. So you have to come up with, anyway, there's various ways of people learning. Um, but the important thing that I try to do with the students is they, like you said, they need the win. They're going to go home and they, or they want to play something for their friends. Yeah. Or something that's familiar, and they and they perks it. You know, they want that. We're musicians. We want the feedback. We want like the, the praise. Right. Like, well, dude, that's awesome. You know, so there are some students that get with teachers, unfortunately, for lengthy periods of time, too focused on a lot of single note, little read this high string thing, and get you know, that's good, but get, you'll get there. It's like they want to play something that's obtainable now so they can get the acceptance from their peers okay that, yeah. that makes them feel like oh cool yeah because it's nothing better than that feeling of being praised so you know in a couple lessons you know maybe three if they if they got those three chords and, and they can play along or you know there's a lot of songs right now that are very easy for kids to learn uh old town road is like one of the, the oh my god anyway but if they can go play that you know really quick after a couple lessons it's like and 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 they like that feedback. They get a little bit of that feeling of, oh, hey, yeah. there's a reward for my work, you know. Rather than a six months later, you know, do you know how to play this song? Well, no, but I can read. Mary had a little M on my high E string. Like, yeah. I, I don't I don't teach them that way. I'm, I mean, unless there's a specific request from a parent or them, sure. I want to learn classical and I want to have theory only, and I'm not interested in this music or this. You know, and then and we, we build them, we build them their package on, on what's going to work for them. So, but man, really, I mean, you, um, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I was just thinking about your history. Like when you and I first met, I think in person, you were managing Guitar Center and, yeah. um, you know, as a successful person in that industry, trying to pair people up with the right instrument that's going to let a fire under them, you know, it's, uh, it's really important. I know that you went on to work like boutique guitar shops. You were recruited away to work in boutique places because you know, you got the ear, but you know, gear really well. And you probably are a really good matchmaker for like, say a particular style mm -hmm. of guitar with a player. I would see that you probably have that same kind of talent for teaching. You know, you can see that one kid might have a propensity to be more right. geared towards, they like, say blues and, and kind of go through some, I mean, I'm guessing I'm speculating, but we eventually, I, we eventually can get there. It depends on the student. Okay. It really is. There's, I think the percentage of students that are really um, adapt immediately have have a natural propensity to to get somewhere with it. Um, you, you know that that whole part moves quicker where you figure out where to guide them. Okay. You know, um, it's probably two in ten. Yeah. I have like forty five students right now, and I would, Yeah. How is that like for virtual lessons? Is that difficult um, to do? Well, I'm at Happy Valley Arts Academy now, and okay. it's on one-on-one. One -on -one. Uh, the setup is different, the way the protocols. There's not a big waiting room with a bunch of people in it anymore. Parents are kind of waiting outside, and the kids come in, and they check in, and then they go to their prospective studios. Uh, you know, we're all masked up, and, you know, in the studios, there's a there's a line, you know, a tape on the floor, and, you know, we do our best to make sure it's safe. Yeah. You know, and, uh, we're, and we're masked, and it's been that way now for it came back to that. I lost probably 80% of my students from the beginning of this. Wow. Amazing. Until they transitioned and said, we're going to offer online now. Okay. Um, and so some of them kind of came back. Some of them just didn't want to come back. Um, and it built slowly online. Um, I never really got too, too many back. Um, but then when they open back up, it's flooded. People are, are signing up. They want yeah. to get their kids in there and we're playing it safe and 
we haven't had any issues, you know. And yeah, it's all it's all been good. It's all been safe, and and the kids are happy. The parents are happy, and, and so it's all you know. It's been it's been great. I think so now I find myself like, holy crap! I have more than I I did before the pandemic. Sure. Oh, well, yeah. I still I still have maybe ten of those are still online because just they look, some of them are great online. Yeah. Some of them are are not. I mean, the small kids know it's really hard. <laughs> it's probably like any you know uh, yeah. academic. I mean, it's from what I hear, right? That a lot of students are are uh, having a difficult time with remote, distant learning. But um, I yeah. was thinking about the fire, you know, that you talked about the winds and the fire under their butt. Yeah. You mentioned um, a couple of the wins that you had. I mean, parents that were teaching guitar lessons. You had the piano there. Who was the first guitarist that you saw live that you said, "Oh wow, that's I want that." First live guitarist. The one that just, you know, that you can still remember today that you get goosebumps when you think about seeing him on stage. Jakey Lee was one of them. Wow. Okay. And that was Badlands. That was back. That was that was Badlands. That was with Ray. I, I, oh I, wow! I, that blew me away. I seen Ingve Malmsteen. He blew me away for a while because you had the classical training as well, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, you know, guys like I was a big Scorpions fan. I mean, Oof. I love the guitar work there. Um, okay, so I even, he kind of impressed me. I, he, I was he he ran across this double stack of marshals in a loincloth and jumped skidded across the floor and when he stopped he blew snot out of his nose <laughs> you know while he was ripping this and he didn't miss a note I was like wow <laughs> yeah. oh, that was cool you know so, i mean he's yeah. not my favorite guitarist but i mean that's just a, a it, you know what i mean that that visual and that experience was pretty incredible let's uh, talk scorpions for a sec you talked about being a scorpions fan like uh were you I, an uh, uli roth guy huh were you an uli roth guy <sighs> yeah I, okay uh, Still, though, I follow probably Michael Schenker more than I, you know, yeah. his, his, his his little thing. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, there's a there's a rush connection, obviously. I mean, you and I have talked about this a lot. My son, Caleb. like Alex just, Lyson, yeah. yeah, man, you've had some awesome experiences. You want to talk about your Alex Lyson, like the, the last experience on the R40 tour? Yeah. Well, through a friend, I got to meet um, Alex, the, the tour before that. I got to meet okay. him backstage and, and that was, that was pretty cool. And I, I'm not really good in those situations. You know, some people are like, Hey, and I'm real, I'm real talkative, just right in their face. And I was like, God, I feel so, I don't want to be in his face. And I don't want to, this is weird. It was awkward. He was really, he's a really nice guy and he's funny and he made me feel comfortable. And, and, and my wife and I talked to him a little bit and, you know, it was funny. Cause I said, I know you hear this like uh, millions of times, but I mean, you really influenced me because of the first things I was learning on guitar were Rush songs. Some of the first things I was like, I can't believe I can play this song, you know, and I play along with the records. And I got in a band with these two guys and, and we were we were jamming out and skipping school and <laughs> playing in the basement, playing Rush songs. And, and it was like we were so proud of ourselves. And I was trying to give him that, you know, experience that I had. And it's like, I, I can't believe now here I'm talking to you. This is really great. And he, and he goes, yeah, you know, and he just kind of. We all have our idols. Mine was, you know, and I used to listen to Cream and I, you know, I, you know, and it's funny just how that how that works and who we're influenced by and what gets us, you know, and then you know you get to meet your stars and he, you know, he was very humble and and it was really cool and that was just a kind of a smaller meeting and and to get to the other one, uh, that same friend, um, I'm going to heavy detail, but got got me into a position to be a roadie for a day, and and with that that visit to portland and so um i showed up i showed up there like early afternoon you know get here early afternoon like one o'clock rolled in um what was really cool is i drove my i got a 65 mustang yes you and do I, and i drove it I, I was driving it in there and they're like make room for this guy here park next to the buses man right here you know i got a picture and it was pretty cool they're all like wow so i got to strike up some conversations with some of the crew and and then, and then I met Alice's, um, you know, guitar tech, and he was just showing me around. Okay, we're going to be doing this. We're going to be doing this. So, you know, the real, real important stuff, you know, that was handled. Uh, but I got to go anywhere during that, you know, and and help you know, take this down here, do this, do that. Here, here's this, here's that. And then I walked 
to his guitar cabinets, his rolling, you know, his rolling anvil guitar cabinets and whatnot, and put all the guitar heads and the switching, and I was just going, oh, my God, this is so cool. And then, you know, handing me these guitars, you know, there's that white Gibson, that hollow body. And, you know, I was like, I love the Strangato video. I mean, he recorded with this thing, and I was just like, you know, and, and then his, there, there was his on a Gracie stand, the 12 string. I videoed that's when I played the uh, Closer to the Heart intro on it. Yeah. You know, I was like, I'm not a big smiler, <laughs> you know, and, and people like, Ryan, that, that's the most I've ever seen you smile. It's like, oh, I couldn't stop, you know. So here yeah. I am, this childhood icon of mine, and here I am about to meet him and, and actually hand him guitars, and, you know, and do that whole thing. And I was just, I got the headset on, I'm listening to them sound check, and it was just like, I was just blown away. It was, wow. I, I can't, couldn't believe it. I had a couple friends to share that with who, who were, you know, they, they knew they were just yeah. like, dude. Yeah. You know, that's as, that's as good as it gets. Yeah. yeah. And so it was fun. I got, I got to meet him and hang out a little bit and hand him some guitars, walk up on the stage while it was full. I was just like, Oh, this is so cool. You know, this is like, wow. You know, and, and here I am, this is like, Rush is probably my number one band. Okay. Here I am handing Alex guitars. Yeah. And so it's like, I, I I was just like at that point I could die now I'm fine. Yeah. And um and I did a shot with him during uh, Neil's two shots with him during Neil's solo. Oh, what's the what's his uh, drink of choice? You know he pulled it out. I don't remember the name of it. He okay. pulled it out of this thing. And he goes, he goes. Okay, it's Neil's solo. Here's where we drink. <laughs> yeah, the, we've got you know, 15, we have 15 minutes. <laughs> you know, and so he's just sitting there and he's just joking around and he's like, you know, we're watching Neil. You know, it's, you know it's, oh it's, my god, this is pretty damn cool. You sat side stage, backstage with Alex Lifeson having a shot, yeah. watching Neil Peart play a drum solo. Yeah. That's that's pretty wicked, man. That yeah. uh, you know, I didn't I I didn't uh, get a chance to meet any of the other guys. They were there, and I and they said just leave them alone unless they approach you. Approach yeah. you. I'm like okay, and they didn't. They they were so in their other zone, and, and yeah. like, I was I was trying to like I was fantasizing about hey Brian, do you know any Rush songs? Oh, <laughs> I was yeah. Like, I was practiced up. I was ready to play uh, Spirit of the Radio, or I had about four lined up. I was going, wouldn't it be cool if uh -huh. I did a sound check with them? Oh, please, please. Man. It didn't happen, but, you know. Were you there for sound check? Yeah. What did they play for sound check? Uh, Do you remember? Visions. They did Jacob's Ladder. They did. What else did they do? I think that was about it. Okay. I, I, one of my favorite things, I mean, especially on the show, right. I, I love, um, and I, I started uploading on the, uh, the channel. Um, sorry, my accountant's calling me. Uh, oh. I, I started uploading, um, videos behind the stage, backstage chats, this kind of thing that we're doing with bands that we've been touring with. Um, I love sound checks on like international bands. So working the kiss show with Dan Pred years ago, I was blown away by their sound check because they're right. doing Montrose tunes and, you know, Hendrix and, it just floored me that they, um, you know, they're not going to play the Kiss tunes for soundcheck. Obviously, they're sick of those. But, but it was fun to hear them doing like rock candy, you know. And, um, but, uh, um, you know, knowing that you felt that way about Rush as a, you know, like this, this, because uh, you're an accomplished musician who's played it all, and yet at any level, right? There's always somebody bigger or more inspiring. As you, uh, you mentioned that you're not a big smiler. I know that. First couple of times that I met you, um, yeah. you're, you're stoic, right? So you're very, uh, you hold your cards close to your vest. And I thought, <laughs> man, this guy, I could try like crazy to get this guy to like me. He does not like me at all. And I realized, man, that is totally, you know what? You're quiet. Yeah. You know, and I, um, uh, it's, you know, such a foreign concept to me, right? Cause I'm just like goofy, giddy. Right. Um, but, uh, did you get this reputation like maybe, uh, back in, you know, the early days of, uh, Portland, um, uh, as being maybe aloof and a little unapproachable? I don't think anything's ever changed. Yeah. <laughs> Same guy from the beginning. All right. The, uh, I know when I see old videos of myself, um, yeah. my old dirty rhythm behind the scenes stuff and things that we did up in Canada and whatnot. I, I rewatch myself. I was a little cocky. Oh, okay. I definitely was a little more animated and goofy around the public, you know, of people that I didn't know. Sure. You know, because I was 20. Something. Yeah. Right. 24. But, um, I think, but I've always been a little bit, 
man, I'm a, I'm a deep thinker. And sometimes when I'm thinking, I'm not smiling. And so people think I'm angry or something or I'm not paying attention. Right. And yeah, I'm a little bit aloof and, I, and I'm aware of it. And, and I try to be cognizant of it because it's actually, I think it's, well, I know other people in my family that are kind of the same way, you know, and I don't, we don't even realize it. Right. Yeah. We, Until they point it, it's pointed out. And, you know, my wife, thank God, she points stuff out to me and I'll listen. And, and, and it's like, oh, wow. Okay. I, I, and, and I know I've heard, I've had people perceive me as something that I really, what? Yeah. <laughs> they got that, that's what? tough, isn't it? That, that's no, that's 180 from the truth. Right. I don't, how do they think that? And then, you know, so it's so why I have to self reflect and, well, okay. You know, yeah, it, it's, it, I, it wasn't intentional, but um, I'm an observer and I, I process before I speak a lot. And um, I guess my facial features when I'm thinking. It resting, you know, resting bitch face. Yeah. Uh, bitch face, you know. It, you know, it's funny. Mike, uh, Mike Diamond here in the chat says, don't you know who the F I think I am? Yes. No, that is not Brian, but that is maybe what somebody might think. Um, you know, how, that, how, how important is it that to you? To uh, you know that people might because you said that some people might think 180 degree difference, right? They think that you're aloof or, or a dick because you're quiet. Does it matter? Well, yeah, I'm kind of like an empath sometimes. You know, I feel uh, I, if I know, yeah, somebody perceives that, or it's just it, it, it kind of ruins me. But um, you know, there's. Okay, well, let me. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm really selective with my close friends. Yeah. They know who I am. Yeah. And I know who they are. And I love everybody, don't get me wrong. But, you know, somebody just told me, um, we were talking about this just the other day. He goes, Yeah, I can walk into a room of people I don't know. And if I'm going to make new friends, I, I, I call them the yeps, nopes, or the maybes. I'm like, wow. Because I can immediately tell if I'm going to connect with somebody, mm -hmm. and it happens. And I think because of when when that, if that clicks right there, I'm sure they see it in my face. Okay. You know, and then they see, oh, look, he's what a nice guy. He's you know, cause he's uh, there's some sort of a reaction going on there. That's not resting rich race. Right. So um, I'm really careful about who I get real close to. Me. Have you always been that way? So, what's that? Um, Have you always been that way? Kind of like guarded, close. To I think so. Okay, yeah. You, know, I find myself getting that way more now. You know, as I get older, maybe a little uh, jaded, right? But uh, I, um, it's interesting because, like I said, the, when I first met you, I thought this guy just doesn't like me. There was the nope. I got the nope when you walked into the, into the room. But I'm going to win you over, my friend. I uh, not intentionally. Let, let, not I, I wasn't looking at you that way at all. No, I, I would I would hope not. But I uh I've really enjoyed getting to know the empath side of brand too. I mean, you and I have talked a lot in the past about people that uh matter to us that have kind of gone through rough time and tried to help those guys out. And I um I think it's great that you've been in that position, right? Because you're um you're well regarded in the community. I think you're uh, connected to the right people and and you know use those connections for the right causes, which is awesome. Um let's talk about some buddies for a second. You want to go to dirty rhythm? This is kind of cool. Like um uh for you know people outside this area that may not know, man, this uh dirty rhythm was this killer hard rock band, hair band. Well, I would I would say hair band, but kind of like a skid row meets uh, you know, like danger danger kind of vibe, early yeah. 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. So tell me about the band. Like, how did you guys know each other? Are they all Portlanders? Yeah. Um, when I moved back from L.A., um, I got into um, a band called Roulette. So uh, at the time, Todd Klingler was our guitar player. He had left. I don't know what the circumstances were, but um, I tried out and um, I got that gig. I showed up with this red Jackson soloist and a red half stack Marshall that I bought down there. You know, I didn't even play a note yet. They're like, Dude, you're in the band. I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like it was funny, but it all it all worked out, and and that's where you know I met Troy Stutzman and oh Ryan, Troy Stutzman, okay, Ryan Ellsworth, you know, and um and then Johnny at the time was their singer uh, singer. Oh. He died. Oh wow. Later. 
But from, anyway, from Roulette. Yeah, he okay. was the first, the first singer, and Andrew uh, Andrew Gill came in. Okay. Andrew Gill was singing. Any, anyway, and then this guy named Bill Tipton came in, and then anyway, through all this, um, things started to evolve, and all of a sudden, it wasn't Roulette anymore, and Dirty Rhythm happened. And Sammy came in. Sammy Sammy Zern came in. Yeah. And, and Grand, you know, remember, you weren't from here. Grand Vision was this band. I think Mike Collins was in Grand Vision. Right. Anyway, and, and their singer Jeff Bonds, he got involved, and suddenly we, hey, we got this new band suddenly, you know, and so it became Dirty Rhythm, which was off of one of uh, Vinnie Vincent's. In yeah. Oh my God, Dirty Rhythm. Yeah. And I think that's all, what, all anyway. systems go. Yeah, and um. So there it was, and and that's what happened. And like Bruce Short was playing bass, and just things evolved and 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 whatnot. And and there was, um, you know, Curtis Salgado got signed by a, yeah. re, a local label, and then the guy Jack Wagner from the the soap opera, um, yeah, went, he got signed by this new label that came into Portland, a guy named Charlie Fatch, who was with Polygram, who was responsible for signing, I guess, or, or the New York Dolls and all that stuff. And he, Tim Blixeth. <laughs> Anyway, Tim Blixeth with this had a country song way back and and knew Charlie Fatch and said, Charlie, come out to the Northwest and let's start a label. And so they got themselves like, you know, some some, you know, big distribution and then affiliated with a label in L.A. And they were looking for a rock band. OK, and they Curtis and they, you know, and anyway, somebody said, you know, check, check out Dirty Rhythm. They're kind of making a splash right now. You know, we were getting good. We had a really great following pretty quick um because of like not not just the music but also everybody was kind of known around the scene so you well yeah a little bit a little bit but we just the other jeff and i when we started writing the singer and i and his voice i mean he just had one of those voices that you know a lot of singers wish they could do yeah he had the range and he had the control and he had the power and and, he, and it was popular to be that guy right that kind of singer you know in that style of music and he just freaking nailed it and so it, it just made it, it just and then, you know, we were all pretty good looking guys too. And, you know, we had the hair, we farmed the hair and, you know, we started packing out Tuesday nights, you know, at Eli's. Okay. Or, yeah. Okay. You know, so there was a buzz going on. And so, um, you know, somehow Charlie and Tim, you know, their BFE, it, BFE records, we changed that name anyway. Um, they came out to see us and then they offered us, you know, long story short, they offered us a deal. We found out that, Paul Dean from Loverboy is going to produce it, and you're going to go up to Canada and record it in his studio. Nice. And spend some time up there. So uh, there we were. Suddenly we we're up in Canada and, and playing, staying at the Nelson Place Hotel on Granville Island, where at the time also David Lee Roth was up there recording an album at Little Mountain Studios. He was doing work up there. He had the whole floor above us. Oh, really? Okay. Or, you know, we were down below. And, and so, and he had his manager or security guy out living in an RV out in the parking lot, you know, and, and actually got to meet him briefly down in the strip club at the very bottom of the hotel. He's there's, sitting a, there. there's a strip club in the hotel that you're staying at? In Canada? Like, yeah, okay. We, we played at this place called Club Soda and Richards on Richards while we were up there. So we, we got ourselves a regular gig while we were recording. Okay. So we would walk, we would go from our hotel and walk three blocks so down three blocks down to the club and we became, you know, and sh her name was Shirley. Anyway, the owner, we got, you know, and Jeff is a cocky guy and he's really a, he's a charmer. And so, you know, we immediately got, you know, we, we were let in no matter what. Oh, let these guys are gone. You know, yeah. So we, got, we got the treatment up in Canada while we were there. And while we were walking through there, I mean, because of the legal uh, properties up there, prostitution. So we were constantly walking through just herds of prostitutes. Oh, hi guys! Yeah. We were so cocky because we're we're rockers. We don't need to pay for it. Right, right, yeah. Hi, girl. You know. Um. Anyway, and what an experience. But anyway, yeah, we're in this uh, the 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 stripper club downstairs, and there's David Lee Roth in front, and he's talking with somebody. I'm, I'm, I'm eavesdropping, and he was actually talking about the surfboard or something that he came out on on their tour. You know, to come out yeah. on. I heard him talking about that before he actually even did it. And I was like, "Ooh, this is cool." Anyway, he, he find I was going to say, "I'm going to, I'm going to at least say hi." And so he stood up, you know. And then I was just like two, two seats back, and I stood up too to kind of like 
like I was on my way out like he was. Oh, hey, you know, hi, Dave. And when it, it was funny, I, I had no idea he was so short. Yeah, so, because his hair was taller than him, right? So yeah. you know, he stood up and he stood up. I all of a sudden I was like, oh, <laughs> it's like, hey, Dave. And I just wanted to just say hi, and I really appreciate you know what you do. It's 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 an it's an honor to meet you. And he just kind of shook my hand and smiled this wide, you know. And he goes, hey, man, it's because of you is why I do it. Oh my god, and just was, you. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, wow. And that was about it. That's that was my meeting with Dave. That uh, I was gonna get. Yeah. It seemed like that would be a good band to actually tour with too, you know, because Dirty Rhythm had, um, you know, there was like kind of a Skid Row vibe. There was a little Danger Danger. The guys were all real pretty, right? Uh, your singer Jeff was the singer. He he looked a lot like Mike Tramp, kind of, you know, White Lion vibe. So yeah, did, yeah did, he kept in really good shape. He had the, the you know an eight pack. Yeah, you know, he just take his shirt off, and then the girls are just. Yeah. You know. What happened with the band? Did you guys do some touring with National Acts? Um, we did a lot of one-offs as far as we like i remember we did a couple kg one shows driving and crying mm. there was uh what was it babylon ab maybe oh yeah that's a great yeah. pairing we did um you know and then we did a lot of playing up in canada while okay. we we're there. the only touring we did in in the states um you know because when they broke us out on radio our radio airplay was pretty heavy in certain markets but they were far away okay oh. You know, it was East Coast or down South, and 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 we had some label problems and we had some management problems, and we just don't have enough time on this interview to get down that road. But I'll bet we we did hop into a couple bands and we went through Idaho and, and into Salt Lake City, Utah, because oh, yeah. major airplay in Salt Lake City. Zephyrs, I bet that's you played Zephyr Club. Uh, no, it was called um, Rap Rafters. Okay, I don't know King's X had just played there. Oh, like nice for us and, and some other bands and and we were we played like three three gigs on the way to salt lake city like through utah and, or, or through idaho and and uh oh man and uh you know it's funny you only you, it only takes a few gigs on the road to have some great stories yeah so, you can tell those stories here there's it's not a kid's show we got to utah and got the rock star treatment because we had rotation yeah you know, with, with, um, feel the fire. So when, you know, they, they picked us up in the limo from the, you know, we got to get the, the treatment. We got the ropes. There were people outside of the club and all screaming when we got out. I was like, no way. You gotta be we kidding made me. It. And they were singing our, they were singing our single that, that was on the, you know, when we, you know, they were just, and I'm just looking at, you know, going, wow, if every kid could be this way. Yeah. You know, that was probably the most, that was the, that was the tease. Okay. Of what I we all felt was going to be from this point on, if gigs are like this, yeah. you know, it, 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 we didn't get one that really taught that. I mean, we we played the Mayor's Ball mm -hmm. here, and we played a couple outdoor festivals here in front of quite a few thousand people. That that was really fun. The Mayor's Ball was awesome. We didn't have the main stage, but we had the uh, next big stage that was next to it, and and I mean, there, I think there was four thousand people watching this, you know, and it, it was just. You know, so we all felt at the time that we're on our way. This is going to happen. And but the one thing that happened, I knew I knew, though, on the way to that Salt Lake City gig, um, Dave Swanson was our road manager. He was he had a, a disc of Temple of the Dog. Oh, wow. Oh, and he goes, Brian, here we go. Listen to this shit. I think you might like it. So I'm in the band. And I'm like. And, and it just starts, and <laughs> I was just looking around going, oh, my God, we're done. Yeah. And, and, but I, 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 I loved it. Yeah. I was yeah. just like, holy crap, we're done, but this is cool. It was really a, an interesting moment. I'll because I, you know, I'm not trying to knock what we were doing. You know, content and vocals, you know, what our message was really stupid. And I mean, it was just all really just nothing. It was just bullshit. No, no, I want to ask about that actually. Cause yeah, I was thinking, I mean, this is, these are really deep song titles. I mean, Jeff Buner was asking about Hard as a Rock. Um, you know, these are because lyrics and, and, you know, song titles are important, right? So tell me about, <laughs> tell me about the, uh, you know, the inspiration for Backside of Your Love. But, but, backside or backside of love. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a double entendre at all. Yeah. You no, know, I'm back then. I'll be honest with you. Back then, I was so into 
the music and my part, yeah, I I honestly sometimes just tune Jeff out. Yeah. Oh, that was his idea. I heard him. I heard him. I mean, his voice was great. Yeah. But I really didn't get deep into his content. Yeah. <laughs> now, KJ would come out and I would just shake my head and I'm just going, God. You know, um, I wanted, I, I, yeah. I, I'm listening to Temple of the Dog and then I'm looking over <sighs> my singer going, one summer night in the back of my car, we were doing it right and we took it too far. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that, that moment, it was kind of like you know, I dude, I hopped on so many bandwagons of music from that point on because everything was changing. I was playing yeah. like that sounded like Pantera. I was playing and I played in a band that sounded you know like I hopped on the the whole Green Day type style pop punk rock wagon for a while and and um, I followed it. You know, there was uh, bands like Cement, who Jolie Lamella was in. Yeah. So they were totally like the Pantera Portland band. Right. Danny Carbo playing, you know, I was just like, oh my God, listen to these guys, you know, and um, I did a, Joe Toth was singing and then I did a brief little thing with this, we called ourselves Buzz Meg and I can't even remember what it meant, but Joey, uh, Joey Woods, their guitar player, but he left and I was playing guitar and I was playing with Joey and, you know, and, and it was just, oh, Pantera style, you know, so I hopped on all those and um, after a while I got tired of hopping on all the bandwagons and I really got into that whole guitar center career thing and, and which sucked the life out of me. And I, I survived it. And I survived it. And I, I saw literally it. I went like this. My hair was short and I had the goatee and I looked like everybody else at those guitar center meetings. Oh, wow. and, I, and I, and I started looking at pictures going, where the F, F did Brian go? Wow. Um, you know, so I've evolved out of that and got myself, my, I'm back. You know, I, I, I will never do that again, but I, I it was good. It was really good for me. Not only I, that, yeah. I mean, the Guitar Center thing and the, the the soulless kind of like career gig maybe was good for you to kind of get there and then move on. But even jumping on bandwagons, because it seems like stylistically your style has become its own too. You know, I don't hear a lot of the stuff that I've heard you do be derivative of one specific genre or anything like that. It's kind of cool that, you know, like your bootlegger stuff is really, yeah. uh, it's, it seems authentic. It seems real, you know, the, uh, somewhere there's an inner, inner, like bluegrass redneck in me. I, yeah. have, no, I have no idea why that, uh, uh um, it'll, be hard. it'll be hard. I, I hadn't asked you this and I, and I never set this up with anybody, but I love to ask guests about a guilty pleasure. Like what's something that Brian hair that, uh, People that know Brian Harrison, who would they be surprised to find out that you'd listen to? I don't know. I have a lot of those, you know. Um, I mean, it's got to be musically. I mean, melody, chords, atmosphere. It's got to move me somehow emotionally. Mm -hmm. It has to be an emotional experience for me. I have to hear. I have to feel or see the landscape that they're they're creating. So, I mean, there's bands. I mean, okay, guilty pleasure would be. Um, you know, some of the vocal, older, medieval style music okay, was, you know, back in the day performed in big, huge cathedrals and it was just vo voice. Wow. You know, so when I hear all those different timbres of voices and all, it's like an orchestra, it's a symphony, but right. it's just voices. So you hear each part and you hear what they're all doing and it's all coming from here. This is our instrument, you know, and people built massive cathedrals even to accentuate it even more right you know to create this i that takes me somewhere i that's probably wow i have some yeah i'll put i'll go on my walks you know with my dogs and like i remember the first time i really started listening to that music and it was foggy out it's gray it's oregon it's foggy gray you know and everything is looks black and white and right. gothic you know and i put in that music and it's just voice and i can hear the reflections off the cathedral they recorded it in and i was just the melody the high stuff the solo parts and i'm just like i'm piecing it all together with and i'm walking and just like i got emotional yeah i just broke down that, you know and i'm like oh my god you know and it's like so all the way from that to you know i i never used to like depeche mode but now i love them i'm with you i i never liked some bands that i just totally love i i never thought i would be into folk music or bluegrass and I love it. So it, it all, I, there's so much music that speaks to me that, you know, I never thought I would like. Sure.
but you know, I'm so I'm just this conduit right now, and I just take it all in, and it's like I, it's almost overwhelming because I get really confused in the studio sometimes creatively what to do because I have so many ideas over here and over here and over here and this style and this style and like, and I think some of it's starting to converge into me. Yeah. Oh look, he borrowed this, or look, he borrowed that, or it sort of sounds like oh, you know. So maybe I'll, I'll, you know, I think maybe I've put a stamp, my own stamp on it, you know. Yeah. That, maybe my own, I guess. I've yeah. robbed everybody, man. Well, I mean, who hasn't, right? But are there kids with, because you've had, like, you said you have a stable of like 45 students now. Yeah. Um, have you had any students come to you that say, hey, look, check this out and have it, has it just really impressed you with some new music? Yeah. Okay. Anything that stands out? Um, Hold on. I got to look it up. All right, no problem. I have it in my searches because I'm like, who's that? And I'm searching, you know. And so if I look at uh, if I look at some of my searches, I'll remember these names. Sure. You know, because I, I don't. Oh, come here. Hey, I, while you do that, you know, come here. I, do you have your Shiba Inus anywhere nearby? Oh God, if you really want me to get them, they might come in here. <laughs> uh oh, I, I was trying to pick mine up because I think I think Edgar would like to go see them. You guys all know Edgar Allan Pug. Look, there's puppies. Watch. Ready? Oh. <gasps> look. Ready? This is Kiba. Oh, look. Puppies. Look. He probably oh, yeah. Hi, Kiba. Hello. We Kiba. need to go. Do, we need to do those puppy walks, right? He's look probably this right now. That, oh, there's the other one. Oh, come here. Come here, Green. Come here, lady girl. There we go. Oh, <laughs> cutie. There's a puppy. Look. Dance. Dance for me. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Look like this and do something. Uh, this, um, just like you, I think you and I have, uh, we've sort of, um, we've developed dream, kind of dream. the necessity to kind of get into nature with our dogs. You know, it's something that for me, it's been uh, my uh, sort of the nourishment of the soul a little bit. Um, have you, uh, like, a, have you always been like a dog guy? Oh, oh! Look at this! Look at the begging! This is so sweet. You know, right? oh, oh my oh, gosh! Oh, that is so adorable! Turn, my goodness! Turn around! Oh yeah, my guy knows the turn trick too, but not the begging. Oh yeah! This is they my are... girlfriend. This is my girlfriend, Dream. Look at that! Hi, Dream. Look at that! That Claudia in Germany. She's a, she's a sweet blonde girl. Yeah, that's your girlfriend, um, and so and your beautiful wife as well, man. We uh we only touched on her a little bit, but um, uh, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about this evolution of Brian Harrison as musician, as creative, um, and Anne's support with that, right? Because you went from, um, you know, singer, songwriter, musician, then you, the major corporate world, you were working as a manager for the music stores, and and at the same time, um, you and Anne have been together quite a while, right? So quite some time. Yeah, we met in 89. Okay. Yeah. So she saw the whole transition. She saw Brian Harrison, the record label guy or record deal, uh, right. with the long, the long hair and then, uh, and go through the corporate, corporate world. Yeah. It, um, how has that been? I mean, you know, if you guys are cool talking about it, I know like for me, uh, and I talked to a lot of musicians who have gone through, um, say, the record deals and the touring and all that and maintained a relationship this whole time. Uh, I, did you feel like it sort of strengthened you guys to be able to have gone there and then made it through it? Yeah, we've been through quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're strong. You know, there was uh, – we didn't – we haven't been together since 89. Oh, okay. We we met and we did it for a while and – and then we didn't, and we stayed friends. Uh, and then we found ourselves back again. You know, okay. so it was just, just being the, the thing. Uh, yeah, and I still, I still had real strong feelings for her, but I had to take care of some other things still. You know, sure. and so she said, you "Get your shit together. I'm out of here," kind of thing. Oh, okay. And, and, and not in a real mean way. She knew. Sure. She she knew what I was going through, and. And she knew I had to make some decisions and deal with some certain things that were still attached to me, you know, being my first wife and having a child, blah, 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 stuff like that. So, um, 
you know, she has known my daughter since she was born. Wow. You know, so um, it's not Anne's daughter. <laughs> yeah. So she knows my daughter since she was born. And, you know, we, I was comfortable enough to share that with her. And, and so she's always been, Anne was always part of my life, regardless if we weren't dating anymore. You know, we were friends. You know, we had occasionally gone out and had a beer or shot some pool, you know, and just catch up on, on stuff. And the thing is, it's like, you know, we just, we just turned into friends with benefits then later, <laughs> you know, we just didn't say much. I would, I might, I might've seen her out at a club or a party an after hours party and she's across the room and we see each other and I'm kind of like, huh, you know, that little head nod and yeah. she's like, and she'd just smile and cheers kind of thing. And then we had, we had some little signals, you know, and we knew that, you know, she'd leave before me. Okay. And I, Oh, about 15 minutes later well i'm out of here and then and anyway so we had we had that going on for a while but it got to a point where she just you know she was getting into her first home and i had some construction experience remodeling and stuff and i offered to help okay so, you know uh -huh. i got i got into that that house of hers and gutted a bathroom and i refinished some floors and i was working side by side with her and her parents and wow people had met me before they didn't really know me though but then here i am again oh it's that brand guy yeah you know and so um that was kind of the staging ground of me coming back into her life you know and earning some trust and some sure and, and, and knowing that that you know so i i did a lot of back-breaking work and, and worked with her dad and sledgehammered stuff and finished stuff and you know so i guess the parents you know you gotta win over the parents that's the way to do it too man they could see you're hard worker responsible taking care of their yeah, daughter and, and and willing to learn her dad yeah. was, her dad was um you know he he could do everything okay he's not gonna hire anybody to do anything period on a car yeah. on a house on a heater on a television set no matter what he's he's fixing it wow super so, man I found myself underneath my Barracuda with him and he was helping me work on it. I had a Barracuda back then, a 69 Barracuda that, that fast back and he was helping me work on it in her garage of her new house. And, and actually it was one of the, it's, it's a movie moment, right? You know, yeah. working on twisting, you know, wrenches and stuff with the dad. And we got done doing what we had to do underneath the car. We got out a little greasy, you know, and then I said, Don, I said, I, I want you to know, I want to ask your daughter to marry me. You know, and he's like, he kind of looked at me and he, he shook my hand really tight. Okay. It's okay with me, Brian. Wow. You know, it's like, wow. So anyway. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Man, you guys, um, it's, it's really beautiful to see you guys together too. There's a lot of respect and admiration, but there's independence there too. You know, she's a really independent person. You could tell. And I think uh, obviously support for you being, you know, musically driven, you know, uh -huh. that's, it's tough to love a music man. That's what Steve Perry tells me. Right. So, but uh, I, well, she, um, she keeps me in line. Yeah. Yeah. And there's certain things that her, with her, with her expectations. And she said some things to me in the past long time ago, if you ever do that again, I swear to God, I'll leave you. Mm. And I said, promise. <laughs> and she said, yeah. And I went, good. You want the accountability, huh? I'm done. Yeah. So that, that was that, that, you know. That's cool. I love it, man. And uh, I'm sure she probably doesn't mind being toted around in that uh, that Mustang either. Dude, I, I've got such a crush on your car, too. Yeah. You know, I, I keep I, going to sell it, but I probably never will. No, you can't. You have a picture of that you want to share? I, I've shown off your pictures a lot of your car. No offense. As much as I've shared with your uh, pictures of your dogs. You know what? Yeah. I, I recently got rid of a lot of all my pictures went to the cloud and, and oh anyway. well maybe people can go to brianharrisonmusic.com. <laughs> they can hit you up and uh, look you know that, what? Uh, if you went to my Facebook, if you went to my Facebook and you just yeah. like if you're a Facebook friend or whatever, and if you went to just uploaded photos, it's in there, man. You'll see yeah. it. Oh, okay, it, cool. God, it's so beautiful, man. That uh yeah, that Mustang is is uh it's gorgeous have you always been a, a hot rod guy yeah yeah if you had uh, unlimited resources what would you pick up oh man um probably a 70 hemi cuda oh wow nice i like the orange and the black one uh, um i know it's a mopar thing and there's mopar people going yeah ford suck right you know, 
Um, I, I'm not that. I don't care. I want, right. want I want one of each of the best. Yeah, right. I really like the Chevelles. You know, um, yeah. I really like um, the Plymouth stuff. Yeah. You know, uh, Challengers Road. I kind of love those. The, the old ones. Yeah, the older ones. Yeah. Uh, I, I I want anything 65, probably to 70. Oh yeah. Uh, um, I would like one of each of those like quintessential muscle cars. Sure. That was yeah. that. This was the one. You know. You know. The, a, a 69 Camaro, you know, SS or something. Well, that would yeah. be. God, that sounds so fun. You know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm a total muscle car freak. I, I don't, I've never put my money and time into it as much as I would put into my guitars or equipment and studio stuff. I'm just, I, I'm not that type of car person. Yeah. I would have to have a lot of extra money to become that guy. Sure. Yeah. And but a lot of extra time. Different, different priorities. Guys like Jay Leno can just go out and buy, you right. know, hundreds of cars at a time, just have a stable. I would want to appreciate them more, right? Just with a right. couple. But I, you know, this is a silly question. Maybe there's not an answer to this, but what is it that makes the Mustang wine the way that it does? I, I love it so much. Even the new ones, you know, the new 5.0s have that same wine. I don't know. I mean, it might have a 302 motor in it. You know, maybe the the type of mufflers I'm using. I don't I know what you mean. Yeah. I know just, what you know. It's gorgeous, man. It's just like a great guitar or anything else, you know, but yeah. I, um, man, listen, I feel like, uh, you know, offline, you and I do need to do the dog walk. We need to get the puppies up in the, uh, the woods. I think it'd be great to, uh, to go five minutes, five minutes from my front door. There's woods and Creek. Me too. That's where I'm going to head right That's... now, as a matter of fact, but, uh, but the uh, next time we do that, they'll bring your, uh, yeah. One. I want you to bring your acapella um, yeah, medieval music as well. I want to listen to those. So um, folks, I really appreciate you guys hanging out. I noticed that there's a whole ton of people over on the Facebook pages that weren't uh, part of this chat. So if you're watching those Facebook pages and you chatted, I'm sorry that I missed your messages. I just now saw that. Um, if you are on Facebook, go over to this YouTube channel, go to youtube.com slash all access live with Kevin Rankin right down there and subscribe to it because um, I uh, I want to not only have this archived, I'll have this on accesskevin.com later this evening. You can look at about 154 episodes of other fantastic, wonderfully musical, uh, talented people, lots of musicians, actors, uh, athletes, that kind of thing. And um, again, uh, they can go to Brian Harris music, Brian Harrison music.com and check out recordings, sign up for lessons and uh, maybe see some uh, opportunity to do some recording with you. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Kim, thank you for inviting me. Thank I'm, thanks. I'm thank a big fan. All. It's an honor to be part of it. Well, I, uh, well, I appreciate uh, all the support. So, yeah. Mutual admiration society, right? So, uh, I, I man, hope all the people out there, I hope to get to see you all those those selfies and videos of you out on tour again. I mean, because it's like, God, hey, look at that. That, uh, yeah, man, I, I definitely. Somebody just asked real quick um, what Jeff Bonds is up to. Do you have a Do you have an answer for that? All I know is he lives in Arizona. Okay, I think he has a kind of a regular gig at some place down there, kind of a loungy thingy. Okay, uh, and I think he's singing with his sister. He has an older sister. Okay, <laughs> and I, that's all I know. Yeah. That meant great voice. I loved it. You know, Brian Harris. Yes, you are up next. Brian Harris is in the chat. And I said, yeah, that was a close one. You're going to be on here, buddy. I've got a lockdown time with you, but uh, another amazing keyboardist. Can't wait to have Brian Harris on. Brian, it's amazing. I do. I, I love him, man. Great human, great player. We're going we're to have him on here. So um, everybody subscribe, make sure you hit this channel up. Brian Harrison. Thank you so much please give Anne a squeeze for me and then take those two pups and uh and love on them and if you guys are up for it i'd love to see you back here again this time tomorrow three o'clock tomorrow and uh again subscribe accesskevin.com brian harrison thanks again to five star guitars right.